Good evening all. Welcome to our webinar. I hope you can hear me. Please let me know. And of course it's time to start our webinar. I'm your host Caroline and I would like you to take a look at our next uh, topic. This time it is IVF and embryo transfer. So we'll learn how important it is to prepare a woman for transfer. We have with us Dr. Dino Demetrulis from Biogenetic Center for Human Product Reproduction, which is located in Athens, Greece. And he will, of course, present um, what he's having in mind. And that will last about 20 to 30 minutes. And of course, then our session, uh, Q&A session will begin. Remember that all is being recorded and will be published the next day online. So if you have any connection issues or you cannot stay for the whole uh, event, then of course you will be able to watch it again. And I guess let's not waste time and begin our presentation. Dr. Dino, are you ready? Yes, I am. Perfect. So go ahead. Okay, well, I want to say good afternoon to all the attenders. It's a great pleasure to be in this uh, webinar, and uh, this is the benefit of Internet. Uh, well, Internet does help in many ways, but not very much in medicine, because it confuses you, because you have the side of the good part and the side of the bad part, and of course you don't know where you belong. So being able to talk with your doctor or to talk with the doctor straightforward through this webinar is very important and very helpful. Well, my name is Dr. Dino Easier, and Dimitrul is the Greek long name. The only reason I became a doctor, a gynecologist, and later an infertility specialist is because I wanted to help every couple to enjoy the happiness of having children. The solution to a problem is always of great importance. But if there is not a solution, then it is not a problem anymore. It is important to understand that infertility is not a disease. If a couple is infertile, it's not sick. Cancer, though, is a disease. The outcome of cancer can be detrimental. Infertility in our days is a problem that can be solved in almost every case. So any infertile couple should not be afraid, should not be anxious, it should leave its time. And if they trust, this is an important word, trust the doctor, they will eventually have a child. Because I don't want to take too much of your precious question and answer time, I'll be very brief in my slides. and without using sophisticated medical expressions and data that probably will put you to sleep. So I hope you don't fall asleep while I'm talking. So you can see the picture of a great American president, an even greater uh, general during World War II. Now we celebrated the 100 years of the end of World War I. Later on we'll be celebrating this. and. This end of this World War II was because of this great general who said, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Infertility is a battle that is fought by the couple and the doctors. We always make plans, but those plans sometimes don't come out, so they are useless. But we never give up planning. Planning is very important, whatever we do in our life. So, how important is it to prepare a woman for transfer? It's extremely important. All the couples go through many investigations, a lot of tests, a lot of money, a lot of anxiety, what the results come out. IVF involves stimulation, involves drugs, involves egg collection, involves fertilization. All these take time, a lot of time, and a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. But this final step before the pregnancy test is done is called embryo transfer. This step can be from a couple seconds to a couple minutes. 
And imagine you spend so much time with test, the procedure, and something goes wrong in these seconds or minutes, everything is gone down the drain. So the final, crucial, and most important step in the IVF procedure is embryo transfer. Unfortunately, the embryo transfer technique has received little attention and the data published are minimal. Some factors that affect pregnancy rate, which are the three most important, is the embryo quality, the uterine receptivity, and the transfer efficiency. Variables that affect pregnancy rates are where do we place the embryos, the day of the transfer. Would that be day two, even day one, at the pronuclear stage? Of course there is positive pregnancy test at day one transfer. Day three, a lot of people talk about day five, blastocyst. Is this the best? The transfer medium. Do we use human serum albumin? Do we use embryo glue? Do we add HCG? Catheter choice. What is the best? Soft? Hard? How many embryos? Years ago, we used to transfer six, eight, ten embryos, but we had the problem of multiple pregnancy. Do we use ultrasound during transfer? Do we always do a mock embryo transfer because the actual embryo transfer? The most important thing for an embryo transfer is the experienced personnel. Does it have to be a doctor? Not always. An experienced nurse or a midwife can do even a better job than a doctor to use ultrasound guidance. The cervical mucus, if there's a lot of cervical mucus, that can affect the transfer. The catheter type, soft is usually better. The ease of the procedure, was it a soft and easy procedure or it was difficult to place the catheter inside the uterus? Did we have to use instruments like a tenaculum, or was the uh, manipulation of the cervix gentle? Is it important to rest after the transfer? Usually not. If there is blood in the catheter, that affects the pregnancy rate. If there is contamination, always have vaginal swabs and tests before you do an embryo transfer to check that there is not a contamination. The position of the embryos in the lower catheter, this is very important, how the embryologist places the embryos in the catheter. Sometimes we have retention of the embryos in the catheters. COVAX in 1999 did a test to see the importance of all these factors, having 10 as the most important. As you can see here, no one has 10. But removal of hydrosulfate is very important. What is a hydrosulfate? That means a, a fallopian tube, that's the salpings, is where the, um, embry the embryo is formed. That means the sperm and the eggs are united. That is a normal fertilization. But in IVF, that doesn't happen. It happens in the lab. So in the fallopian tube, in the tube, you have fluid. That fluid can pass down the uterus and this is toxic to the embryo. So it's very important before you do an IVF procedure and you have hydrosalting, especially, it's very important if you have bilateral hydrosalting, that means both of your fallopian tubes are inflated with water, they should be blocked. It's very important not to remove them, but to block them. It's very important also to have absence of lateral mucus. So that was the second more importance. The type of the catheter, the soft. You should not touch with the catheter of the fundus because then the uterus contracts. And when it contracts, it can expel the embryos. Avoiding tenaculum. Tenaculum is an instrument that sometimes we have to use in order to straighten out the cervix with the uterus for the catheter to pass by the cervical os. Removal of the mucus. Ultrasound. Before doing the procedure, you should know the uterus very well before you do the embryo transfer. 
living in catheter in place for one minute, but that wasn't very important. Bed rest for 30 minutes, one hour, two hours. Trial transfer to do a mock ET before, not extremely necessary. Ultrasonography monitoring and prostaglandins that is like constant to prevent uterine contractions. The goal for a successful pregnancy is always to choose a well experience. Positive thinking is very important. Your doctor to believe in you, to believe that he can, he can get you pregnant and have a calm IVF team. It's important the word team. A gynecologist cannot do it on his own. An embryologist cannot do it on his own. The midwife, the secretary, the psychologist, all of them should be a calm team in order to help who? You, especially the woman. We should not leave the husband out. He's going also through a lot of stress and the husband should always play a role in this. It's not only the woman that has to go through all this process. The husband should always be next to her. We must have a transfer that is automatic. That means there is no pain, there is no trauma to the uterus. And usually it's very important to be between 1.5 to 2 centimeters away from the pandas of the uterus. The mother-to-be, that's how I would call her, she's not a patient. She is the mother-to-be, she feel no pain. There should be no trauma, as we said. No bleeding, no trauma in the cervix before the catheter enters into the uterus. There should be absence of uterine contractions because while the uterus is contracting, the embryos cannot sit still. The mother-to-be should be relaxed. She should always think positive, even if they tell her that her embryos are not of good quality. Many times we see bad quality embryos in our units for, with a positive pregnancy test and women having great embryos not to get pregnant. So never be frightened of anything. Always think positive. Chances are chances. Chances are numbers. Percentage is a number. It doesn't mean anything. The test tells you the answer, not the numbers. IVF. It has been a great support to infertile couples. Since IVF the born of, of the first IVF baby, Louise Brown, in 1978. And this year we're celebrating the 40 years of the birth of the first IVF baby. And we thank both of these great people, Professor Edwards and Professor Specto, the embryologist and the gynecologist, that gave us all this information and all this help to help infertile couples. And next week I will also be attending London in a big meeting where we will be celebrating the 40 years of this first IVF child. Implantation though is the process which still remains questionable. How can we have the best environment for embryos to implant? Still a lot needs to be done. The endometrium. What is this? This comes from the Greek word endo meaning inside, and mitra means uterus. The endometrium is the host of the embryo, where life grows and lives till birth. The endometrium, very briefly, is the inner epithelial layer along with its mucous membrane of the uterus. During pregnancy, the glands and the blood vessels in the endometrium further increase in size and number. Vascular spaces fuse and become interconnected, forming the placenta, which later feeds the pregnancy. Implantation is like Pandora's box. It's everything and nothing. We don't know a lot of things, and even the things that we know, we don't know if they apply. Implantation does not happen at any time. An embryo does not implant at any time during the menstrual cycle. It is the magic time when there is harmony inside the uterus. This harmony is considered as the implantation window. The implantation window is the maximum receptivity of the uterus. 
we have the pre-receptive uterus, the receptive, which is the implantation window, and the post-receptive endometrium. Clinical implantation in humans, it is possible in a maximum of 30% of cases. That's a small number. It doesn't mean that every embryo will implant. Only about 30% of them will implant. Implantation failure is a big challenge for IVF specialists. Think about this question. Is it the embryo or the endometrium that decides if implantation will occur? Think in your head, which one do you think is more important, the embryo or the endometrium? The answer is on the next slide. So keep a number in your head. Who is responsible? The embryo. The embryo is more responsible for a pregnancy, a pregnancy to happen. It's about 60 to 80% whereas the endometrium plays a role of 20 to 40 percent. So a good embryo on a medium endometrium, it will implant. A bad embryo on a fantastic endometrium, it will not. What we call endometrial receptivity? Several unique, and it's important, magical parameters and factors need to coincide in order to establish an endometrium to accept, which is to receive an embryo or embryos. There are a lot of factors like hormonal, immunological, and many, many others. If I start talking about them, we will never end. Assessing the endometrial receptivity. One of the pioneer workers and the endometrium was lawyers when he established the histological evaluation of the endometrium. We have the ultrasound, 3D ultrasound and Doppler, hysteroscopy to check the endometrial cavity for the telescope, electromicroscopy studies, a lot of work has been done on the pineapples, blood and uterine fluid analysis, hormones like estradiol and progesterone, hormone receptors, adhesion molecules, cytokines, and blah, 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 a lot of things. But can this help us? We still don't know. The most important thing at the moment regarding endometrial receptivity is the endometrial thickness. A good thickness is between 8 and 10 millimeters. The volume blood flow parameters, as you can see on your right hand side, there's a good blood flow and on the left hand side is a good trilaminar endometrium. Always the patient should look and observe on the ultrasound the endometrium. And if they're not happy about something, they should always ask questions. Never be afraid to challenge your doctor on what you do and what you see. Markers for endometrial receptivity, again, we can talk a lot of us about histological, biochemical, molecular, transcriptomics, which it will take us ages. Just some information, test for endometrial receptivity, the integrity expression of beta 3 integrin, the endometrial functional test. Now, more recently, we have the omics technology, the genomics, which has involved with, um, with the chromosomes, the epigenomics, the structures of those chromosomes, transcriptomics, proteomics that deals with the proteins, metabolomics that deals with the metabolites. Just something very important to know is about 20 thousand protein coding genes are expressed in human cells and some 70 percent this number is quite big of these genes are expressed in the normal endometrium so you see how complicated is the endometrium transcriptomics is the most common studies in order this carrot to implant and form this baby it's very important that the endometrium is very well excessive so a test that helps for endometrial receptivity is called the ERA test. Endometrial receptivity decreases with the following conditions. Hydrosalpensis, that means fluid in the fallopian tube. Endometriosis, this is a little bit controversial because we've seen in patients having endometriosis when they use donor eggs, the endometriosis not increased 
the miscarriage rate. Adenomyosis does affect endometrial polyps, does affect polycystic ovaries, fibroid uterus. If there are a lot of fibroids, it affects the uh, blood vessels and uterine malformations. That means if you have a biconiate or a unicornid uterus. Proper procedure for preparing endometrium from, for transfer. Is there a proper procedure? No. Every patient, and it's very important to know, every cycle is a unique one. Every time you do an IVF, yes, there is a similarity, but it's not always the same. The infertility specialist should see all the parameters in order to do the best for the couple. The proper procedure actually does not exist. What should be done is the best for the best outcome, a healthy child. What does this mean? The specialist should always try his best to do the best for the couple. How? With doing a good history and a correct investigation. And every time you go through, you should look back what went wrong in order to do something different. What to do? This is a huge question for every couple. Is there something right or something wrong? No, because when you think you do the right thing, you have a negative pregnancy test, and something just by coincidence happens, you get a positive pregnancy test. Which way and how to place the embryos? Is there a correct way? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There's a lot of questions about after embryo transfer. Patients are saying, no, 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 I don't want to get up. I don't want to go to the toilet. Let me stay in bed. My embryos will fall out. No, the embryos don't fall out. The endometrium, if it's receptive, it works like a vacuum cleaner. It just sucks the embryos. The embryos would not, fight, would not fall out. Have positive thinking. Talk to your embryos. They are your babies. Talk to them. Think positive. Mother Nature does it all. When you're not doing IVF, when there is not an embryo transfer, you don't think about it at all. A normal pregnancy does happen. And thank God, that's why we are here today, all of us. Most of us, well, I believe almost all of us, came out from a nat natural conception. So the embryos don't fall out. There's no restrictions in normal life. What should there be restrictions when we try IVF? But if normal life does not succeed, you should trust your specialist. He, should, he is the one that he will help you to find the solution. What can help? Vitamins, folic acid, vitamin D, other medications like Viagra in order to increase the vascularity. Uh, estradiol, patches, foam. You should always have a positive self-esteem. You should always think positive. It's very important. The psychology should always be of you will succeed. You will never fail. If, it, if you fail, though, because this is also part of the game, then you see what you do with the next step. Body shape. If you have increased weight, lose weight. If, you have, if you're underweight, gain some weight. Use alternative medicine. Don't be afraid to have acupuncture. Even homeopathy. Aromatherapy, yoga, reflexology, anything that you think will help you. All of these things can help you. They can always play a role in the puzzle, which is to have a baby. Enjoy your IVF procedure. Have fun. Don't be under stress. All these things will help you. And most important, ask questions to your doctors. A lot of things are being said recently about freeze off. Is this an alternative success story? In some cases, yes. Does it give you better results? Yes, in some cases. Like when you have hyperstimulation, definitely you don't want to put an embryo back because that can be quite bad for the woman. Suddenly, you might see an endometrial polyp that you haven't seen before. You will not do a transfer. You have to freeze those embryos. If you have to do PGD or PGS, and maybe the endometrial window will not be the proper one, so you wait for another cycle. You have premature progesterone rise. We always check progesterone at the time of egg collection. It should not be increased. If you have a thin endometrium, 
then you try to get better to me to him, so you never do a transfer because your success rate will be very low. And if you have a current implantation failure, you freeze all your embryos and you try to see when you get the best embryo. The aim of every infertility specialist is to make couples happy. And if you trust your doctors, I think you always become a parent. Thank you very much for listening and I hope that every infertile couple succeeds and get a Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Dino, for the presentation. I believe we can now move on to our Q&A session. We have some questions uh, right here, so let's let's start with them. We have a question. I have difficulties in embryo transfer. Is it very pain? It is very painful for me, and the doctors found the transfer not easy for me. What can I do? Can I use painkiller prior to the transfer? Yes, you can use painkiller, but uh, we have to find the reason why it's painful for you. Is it the speculum that uh, is painful for you? Is it the anxiety of the procedure? Have you done a hysteroscopy before? Is there is a possibility if it's too painful for you to do it under anesthetic? So if the painkiller doesn't help you, then you can do under anesthetic. Okay, thank you for answering that. Let's have another question. Uh, does food or drink affect implantation? Well, Food, no, but drink, of course, you won't be drunk because of the anxiety. It's not a good idea to have uh, three or four whiskeys or to have two or three cups of coffee because coffee stimulates the uterus and uh, you can have contractions. Eating any kind of food you want, that's no problem. If you want to have a glass of wine or a glass of whiskey or whatever before the transfer because you're anxious about it, yeah, that's fine, no problem. Okay, thank you. We have another question. We have had four cycles of IVF two times. I have started bleeding before the pregnancy blood test and then two times it all seems to be okay. But I am getting a negative result. Two times we have had to do the transfer whilst I am sedated as I find it painful. What do you think of this? Is this the correct approach? If you're asking me about being sedated, not to feel the pain, yes, it is the correct approach. But the reason you're not getting pregnant, it uh, can be something else. But as I said in my talk, the embryo transfer should be automatic. It's a procedure that takes seconds and it's a procedure that can be detrimental for a negative result. So you need to be relaxed. The doctor, should be relaxed, he should not be under pressure and if all of them you do the work under harmony then you increase the chances of getting a pregnancy test. So if you feel that you'll be more relaxed if you're sedated it's not a bad idea. The drugs that we use for sedation does not affect the pregnancy rate. All right, thank you. We have another question from Tara this time. I had miscarriage week, uh, week 8 with IVF with egg donor. Was it most likely something I did wrong or not? I used vaginal sorry, cream on once in, a, in the morning and once at night, but within a two-hour window. Is that wrong? Does it have to be administered exactly the same time? Okay. It's very important because you reached the eighth week and it was with a donor. So that means the donor was a young woman. So it's very important to know the reason you miscarried. So a chromosome analysis should have been done in the embryo that you miscarried to make sure that it was chromosomal normal. Now regarding vaginal crinone, uh, it's not very important to use the exact time. What is important is that you have the, around, the correct amount of progesterone in your blood system. So if you use only quinone, and you know this is something important, when we measure progesterone and we use vaginal progesterone, the 
test result is not measuring the progesterone that is used vaginally. So maybe the progesterone that you used was not enough. Regarding the time, not to worry. It doesn't have to be exact. It's the amount of progesterone that is in your blood system because you were doing uh, donor eggs. That means that your ovaries are not functioning. So your ovaries are not producing progesterone. Maybe the amount of progesterone prenone was too little for you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. We have another question from Karen this time. I had my hydrosplenes removed a few years back, but you said they should be blocked only and not removed. Why? Thank you for that question. It's very important. The ovary receives blood of vessels, the, the ovarian vessel and the fallopian tube vessels. So if you remove the tube, you are affecting the vascularity, you're affecting the blood supply to the ovary, and that can affect the ovary regarding the egg quality and the amount of eggs. So the best thing is the vascularity not to be affected to the ovary by removing the tube, but to block the tube as closer to the uterus and remove also a small piece. So that means there is no fluid from the tube going down to the uterus, so there is no toxic material affecting the embryos, but the ovary would not be affected at all. Okay, thank you. Is prednisolone indicated? If yes, what dose? Well, we always used uh, cortisone in order to decrease the immune system. Um, well, most of the studies suggest no. You should not use cortisone. Now, sometimes we have to use things that uh, research says is not useful, and it does help. Your doctor has to see your history in order to decide if to, if to give you or not to give you. Five milligrams once a day is fine, but it's not mandatory to take it. If you ask me, do I give it to my patients? Yes, I give it to every patient. Is it necessary? No, it's not necessary. But it doesn't harm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Karen. I also had first IVF, which was successful, but miscarried. After that, I had four frozen transferred or failed. Do you think that this is due to the embryos being frozen? No, no, it's not uh, because the embryos were frozen. It all depends how old are you, uh, what quality of embryos you had. And the other thing, after you miscarried, did you have a scrape? Did you have a DNC? How is your endometrium? I recommend you, before you do another IVF, if you have any more frozen embryos, definitely do a hysteroscopy. Okay, thank you. Is it okay to drink a cup of coffee during IVF treatment or should we stop drinking coffee? No, you should drink coffee and, def and definitely not decaffeinated coffee. You should enjoy your life. You should be like normal life. You should never stop your habits. Only bad habits. Bad habits is smoking. Smoking, one pack of cigarettes, drinking more or three or four cups of coffee. Instead of drinking one glass of wine, bad habit is drinking four or five glasses of wine. No, live your life normally, but don't overdo it. Okay, perfect, thank you. We have another question from Lily this time. There is ERA endometrial receptivity analysis. Have you heard of this worth it doing before implanting embryo? Well, is it worth? Yes, only if you have recurrent implantation failure. That means if you are young and you have good quality embryos. When I say young, about I'm talking about know how you feel, how you look. I'm talking about how old are your ovaries. If you are less than 35 and you have repeated implantation failure, 
definitely you have to do it. It will help. But the other things before to do that, to do a scrape of the uterus, to do a hysteroscopy before that. Endometrial scratching now we do quite often. And um, the other thing, if you're older, after the age of 35, and uh, you have good quality of embryos, that is after discussion with the embryologist, tell you, no, your embryos are fine, you have a great endometrium, you get eight millimeters of endometrium, I can understand why there's not implantation. And of course, you excluded the semen problem, there's no problem with the sperm, then yes, it is worth it. Right, perfect, thank you. And we have another question from Lara. I have an, a stressful job and have deferred my IVF cycle several times as a result. I am 48 and don't want to defer any longer, but can't leave my job yet as I need the income. What can I do? Well, uh, in life, we always see what is important. Of course, the job is important because it's your income. But what happens? If you're ill, do you go to your job? No. What happens if you have an accident, you break a leg, and you have to be in the hospital? Do you go to your job? No. Of course, you don't have to see it like that, but family, you have to see how important for you. Having a child is not like, oh, I don't have milk at the house, let me go to the supermarket and get a bottle. Let me go and have IVF to have a child. No. You should not see it like that. You should see how important for you is to have a child. If it's very important, then you say, this time, I will spend more time with my specialist to find the solution for me of having children. Well, at the age of 48, uh, the best way to achieve a pregnancy is to go with donor eggs. So what you do is you find your center, you talk with your doctors, okay, you continue with your job, you don't have to stop your job, you just have to spend a little bit more time regarding your infertility problem and less time with your job. You don't say, oh, I'm stopping my job now, I have to look after having a baby. No, no, no. Just have more time for the infertility problem and less time for your job. All right, perfect. Thank you for that as well. And let's uh, have another question. Do you recommend transfer of egg at the same cycle of egg collection? Well, this is normal. This is what we do. We have the embryos, and then according to the number of em embryos, the quality of the embryos, we decide which day to do the embryo transfer. Do we do it on day two, day three, day five? Unless there is a problem either with the endometrium, or there is, you have recurrent implantation failure, or you have hyperstimulation, then, or there is a polyp in the endometrium, then you don't do an embryo transfer. You have to make sure that there is a harmony between the embryo, that means a good embryo, and a good endometrium. Then you do your transfer. Otherwise, if you don't have a good endometrium, no, you don't try to do the transfer because you will increase, listen to this, increase the chances of failure. It doesn't mean you will definitely fail. You will increase the chances of failure. And then if you fail, well, if you succeed, everyone is happy. But if you fail, then you would know the reason why you failed. It is not good for you to know the reason why you failed and you went ahead. All right, thank you. And what is the correct dose of progesterone? There is not a correct dose of progesterone. We have three ways of administering progesterone. One is vaginal, one is intramuscular, and the other is by mouth. Now, the absorbance of progesterone is Every, it's different in any way you give it. So the best thing is to measure progesterone, to know that you have at least 20 nanograms per ml of progesterone in your blood system. Anything above that is good. Anything less than that, you have to think of giving more progesterone. The research suggests that giving progesterone vaginally, it is absorbed better through the uterus and straight to the embryos than giving it by mouth. But sometimes the level is not of, uh, at the right uh, number, so we might have to give intramuscular progesterone. So the correct dose does not exist. What exists is the right 
amount of progesterone in the blood system and the progesterone intervagina which we cannot measure. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from Tara. Should exon and embryo's blastocyst only to implant it or will good quality also result in successful pregnancy? Well, if you have perfect blastocyst and a nice endometrium, you should be pregnant. Otherwise, there's some other problem that we, could, we didn't find. So you need more investigations. Well, blastocyst, in order to go to blastocyst stage, you must have a lot of embryos. Otherwise, you lose a lot, which those that you lose might be normal. So if they were transferred inside the uterus, maybe they will have survived. Whereas in the laboratory, even though our systems today are very good, they are not perfect. They are not like the uterus. We don't have a man-made uterus. We have instruments that resemble the environment, but it's not a uterus. So it's very important to decide what is best for you. And the best for you to go for blastocyst transfer if you have uh, enough embryos or you have previous failures of implantation, which means you need to see if those embryos will end up to blastocyst. And you should always be ready to hear the word, I'm sorry, we will not, the word is not do embryo transfer because we don't have any embryos. And this is because none of the embryos went to blastocyst. But if you were to put any of those embryos that didn't go to blastocyst earlier in the uterus, could you have a pregnancy? Yes, you could have. So it's very important. There's not one thing to do in infertility. You have to see all the aspects. Consider infertility, everyone that is listening, as a big puzzle. Every part plays a role in it. The most important part of the puzzle and the biggest part of the puzzle is the egg. All right, thank you for that question as well. Um, can poor quality sperm cause miscarriage? The answer is yes, but as I said, the most important role in forming a human being is the egg. A good quality egg can cover a bad quality sperm. But answering straightforward to this question is yes. But when we do a semen analysis and we see a bad quality sperm, we don't say, okay, bad quality sperm looks to IVF. We should try to find why this sperm is bad. And if we find a reason, most of the times we don't, we have to treat it. And also, if we have a bad sperm, we should help the sperm by giving antioxidants to give vitamins. We cannot do a big help to the sperm, but if you give all these medications, all these vitamins to a male for three months at least, definitely you will have a better sperm when you do IVF. The sperm also plays its role in miscarriage. We have a good embryo, but then at the end it miscarries because the chromosomes were not normal from the sperm. So, yes, you should always make sure that you've done the best to help a, a bad sperm before you do ICSI, the intracytoplasmic sperm infection. Okay, perfect. Thank you for this as well. And let's take a look at the next question. Can egg transfer be done in natural cycle? I mean that the patient does not take medicine. Of course, natural cycle is natural cycle. It's sometimes more difficult to do it because you have to do a lot of monitoring and you can find, uh, you have to find the correct, um, uh, the endometrium when it's most receptive. You have to find the endometrial window, so the implantation window. Well, yes, it is possible, it is possible, but if you don't do it under natural cycle, then you have more control, you know exactly how the hormones work. But if you feel that you don't want to take any medicine, yes, it is possible to do it under natural cycle, 
And this is up to you to decide. But your doctor, that you and your doctor decide to do a natural cycle, you have to be very careful on measuring the hormones like estradiol, LH, and progesterone. All right. Thank you for this as well. And let's have another question from Sarah. Um, okay, I just joined. Apologizing, the rupture has been given. What is the recommended preparation protocol before returning frozen embryos from egg donation? Okay, we have embryos from egg donation. Okay, you should prepare your endometrium. It's very important to know that when you transfer these embryos, which are good embryos because the donor is a young donor, now we we talked about the sperm from a question from the previous um, attendant. It's important to know that also the sperm was good. So you have a good embryo because you have a good egg and a good sperm. So now you need a good endometrium. So in order to prepare the endometrium, of course, you can do it under natural cycle or you can do it by preparing the endometrium. That is, by stopping the ovaries from working and then by controlling the endometrium with estradiol, that means with tablets, either by mouth or by intravaginal or by patches, and then you are sure that you reach a good endometrium and then you give the progesterone. Whereas in natural cycle, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to know exactly when ovulation will happen, and that's when progesterone starts. So you might lose the implantation window. Okay, let me find out what happened. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, let's have our second, okay? I will try to get in touch with Dr. Dino. Okay. Hello? Now. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I guess we got disconnected for a second, but I can hear you now. That's good. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So we will go back uh, to this question, perhaps, okay? If you could just... Uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Well, you can have an embryo transfer of embryos, good quality embryos. In order to have a good quality embryo, that means you have a good egg and a good sperm. So if you have a good quality embryo and a well-prepared endometrium, an endometrium can be prepared by having an injection of a GnRH analog, which will stop your period. That means there is no hormones produced by your ovaries. Then you take the hormones by mouth or vaginally or by patches and then you observe the endometrium and when there's a normal size endometrium about 8 to 10 millimeters then you give the progesterone so you know exactly you control the endometrium you know exactly that the endometrium is normal and you know exactly when you give progesterone you can do it also on the natural cycle but natural cycle you have to be careful that you lose the LH surge, that means you have ovulation and then progesterone rises up. So you lose the implantation window. You get a better implantation window if you control the endometrium by not having uh, hormones produced by your ovaries, but controlling it by giving con uh, hormones externally. So I would say when you do um, egg donation, uh, and you do program with embryos for make donation, uh, don't try natural cycle. All right, perfect. Thank you for repeating that as well. And let's have another question from Karen. 
We had one time failed to implant and second time donor cycle no implantation. I previously had big fibroid removed. What investigation would you recommend age 44? Well, definitely I recommend hysteroscopy. Definitely that because you need to see how the uterine cavity is after the uh, myelectomy, after the fibroids have been removed. So that will also help you to know if there is any problem in the uterus, to solve this problem. And if there is nothing and the uterine cavity is completely normal, then you have done what we call the endometrial scratching. And that will increase the chances of you getting pregnant. But again, was this embryo good quality embryo with the sperm good with the eggs good of a young do donor and you have good embryos so if the answer is yes the embryo was perfect then a hysteroscopy will definitely help you and i wish you the best next time okay thank you we use egg donor three embryo transfer doctor says might be unseen egg donor issues what do you think that an unseen issue could be is that is that possible that the donor was, uh, the old donor was being used? Well, this is what I said in my speech is never be afraid to ask your doctor any questions you have. You should challenge your doctors like three embryo transfers and if all these three embryo transfers were with egg, uh, from egg donor, that means that you have good quality embryos. There must be a reason why you're not getting pregnant. You need more investigation. Uh, as I said again, today there is no couple that cannot have a child. Every couple should be able to have a child, even with a surrogate mother, let's say. But in your case, I think you should put everything down. The sperm quality, the egg quality. How old was the donor? Was this donor um, is, is this donor matching your blood type? Um, as I said again, the sperm, is it all normal, your husband's sperm? And your uterus, is your endometrium normal size? Is everything well? Do um, you need to take any other medicine, like uh, you need to take aspirin, or you need to take some anticoagulant? Was your progesterone normal? Were you given the right drugs after the um, transfer? Was your endometrium prepared well? So you just have to sit down with your doctor and say, okay, let's see all the parameters that affect me getting pregnant. Have we checked everything? Have we done everything? Then you can say, yes, there is the possibility of luck, that you were unlucky. But you should make sure that all the parameters have been checked correctly. All right, thank you. And from Karen, we have, do you recommend third day transfer or fifth day blastocyst? I have small fibroid, 47 year old using donor eggs. Well, it all depends how many eggs you have from the donor. If you have a lot of eggs from the donor, that means more than eight. I definitely recommend day five, which is blastocyst transfer. Regarding your fibroid, you, you say small fibroids. How many of them? Are they three, four, or five? And um, the other thing is definitely, uh, before I do my next transfer, I will do a hysteroscopy about three to four weeks before I start preparing my endometrium for the embryo transfer. So. If you have less eggs, so then if you have less embryos, I would uh, recommend day three. And uh, the rest of the embryos, you can wait to see if they go to blastocyst, and if they go to blastocyst, freeze them. If they don't go, again, don't worry that you will not get pregnant. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. As I said before, not all of the embryos reach blastocyst, and if they were put back to the uterus, they probably would have survived. So again, don't worry about that. So it will all depend how many eggs you have. But definitely, next time, do a hysteroscopy before you do any transfer. And uh, if, again, you don't get pregnant, then uh, yes, you should remove your fibroids. You should remove those fibroids. Okay, thank you. 
Hi, I had two fine IVF cycles and I'm thinking of going to Greece for egg donor, preferable in Thessaloniki. Which clinic would you recommend? Given though I am Greek, I am nervous to do it alone. Any suggestions? I am hoping to do a two embryo transfer. Would you recommend it? I am 46. Well, uh, two embryos, this is the correct. You either the law allows maximum two embryos to be uh, implanted. Uh, this is your decision. If you are afraid of twins, then you do one embryo transfer. Regarding which clinic, there's uh, many clinics in Thessaloniki. All of them have good results. You just have to visit them, see which doctor matches with you, see which doctor you trust, and that's what you will do. You just have to trust your doctor, but you have to decide. Even if your friend tells you, look, I went to that clinic, it's the best clinic, you should go there. Okay, accept that, but it doesn't mean that you have to, to stay with them. You have to go to yourself and you have you to have to decide if this doctor is good for you, if this doctor, you can trust him to help you in your infertility problem. Otherwise, you don't have to go. It's just simple to go and visit two or three units in Thessaloniki and then you just decide which one you want to go. It's your decision, mainly yours, but also your husband. Okay, thank you for that. Do you offer a Skype consultation? If yes, how much does it cost? Well, yes, I offer a Skype consultation. It's free. Okay, thank you. From Anne Marie Taylor, we have another question. Are there more risks to transfer two embryos than one embryo? There's no risk. The only risk it is that you have a multiple pregnancy, twins. I like twins. I love twins because always when you have one child, you always want to have a second one. And if you don't want the second one, then you're trying to say, oh, I want a brother or I want a sister, then you have to go again through the whole process. So having twins, it might be a difficult pregnancy. Yes, it's true. You have a premature labor. It's more difficult to raise two children simultaneously. But I love twins because with one procedure, you get two children. With one delivery, you get two children. When you change diapers, you change the diaper even for the second child. Because after three or four years, when you have a second child, then you have to go back again, again through IVF, again through delivery, again through changing diapers, again breastfeeding, and all these things. It's tiring. So by having twins is the best thing for all of us. I don't have to worry again, will you get pregnant or not? With having twins, you finish your family so that well. If you want a third child, that's different. But always, we always want a second child. So twins is the best. Two embryos gives you better chances of getting pregnant. Of course, it increases the chances of getting twins. But twins, it, it's very nice to have them. You finish one and for all. Okay, thank you. How can we know that there is a possibility of overstimulation? Well, hyperstimulation. Uh, this is a risk, and uh, today the chances of having a patient with hyperstimulation uh, decrease quite a lot. Why? Because uh, we know the ovaries before, like if they are polycystic ovaries. We know with the hormone AMH, if it's high, that this patient is high risk of hyperstimulation. So we monitor the patient more closely. We don't give them too much drugs. So the amount of drugs they take is minimal. And then we don't do a transfer. And then we have other medications like cabergolin, dostinex, that decreases the chances of hyperstimulation. So today, the percentage of hyperstimulated patients has decreased quite a lot. And another drug is the antagonist that also helps not to increase the estradiol, so you decrease the chances of hyperstimulation. So, if your doctor knows that you have polycystic ovaries or high AMH, he will control you much better, and I'm almost sure that you will, know that you will not end up with severe hyperstimulation. Maybe a mi minor hyperstimulation, but definitely not a major hyperstimulation if you are looked after well. And I believe every doctor today looks after his patients very well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I do see, um, I mean, it's 
going to be, um, we have a lot of few questions, uh, but of course we will start uh, to finish slowly, okay? Uh, but let's get uh, the other question from Sarah. How can I improve the quality of the endometrium? Well, sometimes you cannot. This is your endometrium. Why is this? It has to, we have to check your history. One is after scrapes, after DNCs, after miscarriages. Now, how can we help? There's a lot of things. Is uh, if you have adhesions in your uterus, which is makes bad endometrium, by doing a hysteroscopy, the most important thing today is to assess the endometrium. And thank God, with the hysteroscopy, we can assess very well how the uterus inside looks, and if there are any adhesions, we can uh, break them. Now, we use uh, Viagra in order to increase the vascularity, that means the estradiol, the estrogens that we take, to go to the uterus and affect the endometrium, okay? So, by scraping the endometrium, uh, we can increase the implantation possibility, but again, if you have a good quality of embryo, you have high chances of getting pregnant even with a bad endometrium. Because a lot of things we say about the endometrium, if it's less than five millimeters, usually there's not a pregnancy. Well, this is the word that we use, usually. It doesn't mean that you will not get pregnant. It means that you have very low possibility of getting pregnant. We know the ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy, that means the pregnancy is in the ovary or in the fallopian tube or outside in the intestine. Is there, is there endometrium? No, there is not endometrium there. But how come we have a pregnancy there? There is a possibility. So, again, the endometrium, a lot of things need to be straightened out about this endometrium. Now, it all depends what is the problem of your endometrium and then we can find the solution. Okay, thank you. And so let's take a look at the next question. Is that egg and sperm should be mixed on the same day? If yes, what should be the timing after the sperm, sperm is produced? Well, it all depends if you do ICSI or normal IVF, okay? Well, it all depends on the quality of the eggs and uh, the embryologists have to decide on that according to the quality of the eggs. The husband has to produce the sperm at the time of egg collection and the sperm is prepared according. And after you have the prepared sperm, then you have to check the eggs. And ICSI, we have to know that ICSI is done only on mature eggs. Uh, when they are a metaphase two, that means mature egg. If you don't have a mature egg, then you cannot inject the sperm inside it. Now, if you do IVF, you don't strip the eggs. That means you don't take the cells out of the eggs in order to check out their, if they are mature. Those cells are the ones that give food, I say in simple words, to the eggs. Some eggs that are not mature, they can later mature. So that means we can have a better egg to uh, get uh, fertilized. So the timing is according which procedure you do. It's not a problem. Of course, it's done the same day. Yes, it has to be done on the same day. All right. Thank you. And what should be done to avoid miscarriage as an older patient? Uh, well. Miscarriage is uh, part, uh, uh, any woman that gets pregnant, she has a chance of getting a miscarriage. Well, uh, an older woman has a high chances of getting miscarriage. So in order to avoid, you have to exclude things you can control, like um, give to the patient anticoagulants, so it has a better circulation for the hormones to feed the pregnancy. Then uh, the other thing is you have to make sure that the hormones that feed the pregnancy uh, like estradiol and progesterone are at the right levels. So if you do all this, then you decrease the chances. But we have to know that 80% of a miscarriage is due to chromosomal abnormality. 
So the older the woman is, the higher the chances of having an abnormal embryo implanted. That means a higher chance of miscarrying. So you just have to make sure if you miscarry, it's very important to do a chromosomal analysis to the embryo that you miscarry in order to make sure what was the cause of miscarriage. Because if the cause was a chromosomal anomaly to the embryo, then you're more relaxed. You don't have to worry. But if this was a normal embryo, normal chromosomal embryo, then you have to do more of research to find the cause of the miscarriage. Okay, thank you. From Francesca, we have another question. I have a bio coordinates or uterus and I'm using embryo donation. Is there anything I can do about the uterus being this shape to help improve my chances? Well, I'm sure that she had a hysteroscopy and uh, I'm sure that we um, had a laparoscopy to make sure that this is a biconia uterus, not a septated uterus, because if it's a septated uterus, you can fix this uterus. But if it's a biconia, you have to do a hysteroscopy to both cornea in order to see which one is the bigger cornea, and this is where you do your transfer. And the recommendation in this case is you um, transfer one embryo, not two embryos. And uh, again, uh, it's a good idea to do a scrape or a pipel biopsy or even better, a hysteroscopy before you do uh, an embryo transfer with uh, donor egg. I, it's a, don't worry about the bicornal uterus, even though it's an increased chance of miscarriage, but using donor eggs, at least from a young, this is very important, that the donor is a young girl, that means she's between 22 to 28 years old, you have very good chances of uh, getting a, a pregnancy. But you have to be careful because you are in an increased possibility of uh, miscarriage. Not an early miscarriage, but a second trimester miscarriage. So you just have to take it very easy. And to speak with your doctor, you need to have a sick class. Okay, thank you for explaining that. And do you recommend blastocyst transfer or the third day embryo? For example, if I have three embryos at day three, do you recommend to wait for blastocyst stage or transfer these embryos? If you only have three embryos, if uh, at day two, fertilization says that three embryos have fertilized and uh, there are two or four cells, then I will not wait for day three. I will put those three embryos back at day two. Regarding that you are at the age, it depends also on the law of the country that you're doing um, the embryo transfer. Because if you are at the age of 32, you can only transfer two embryos in Greece. If you are more than 38, yes, you can put three embryos back. So I will put them on day two and I will not wait for day three. Day three, it's better if you have five or six embryos to see which are the best two to put back or the best three to put back. Blastocyst, you do if you have about eight to ten embryos because you will lose a lot of them till uh, day five. So less embryos, day two is better. More embryos, day three is better. More and more embryos, about eight to ten, blastocyst is better. All right, thank you. And we have another question from Lara. Can you have low poor sperm count and good egg and still have good grade quality embryo? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of parameters that we check now about the sperm. It's not only the count. It's not uh, the quality, let's say. It's the quality also. It's not only the quantity, the number. It's also the morphology of the sperm, okay? And it's also the movement of the sperm, the motility of the sperm. But now we check the fragmentation, the DNA fragmentation, the percentage of how many sperms have fragmented DNA or the increased oxidative stress of the sperm. So what I want to say is you might have a low count sperm but a good fragmentation index and you might have a high count sperm and a low fragmentation index. So one parameter, meaning low sperm count 
doesn't mean a lot. You have to check all the other parameters in order to make a decision if you have a good or a bad quality sperm. And if the sperm is a bad quality, before you do your IVF, you should take antioxidative drugs, you should take the vitamins, in all, and the only reason you take them for at least three months is to make it at least slightly better sperm, to increase your chances of getting a good quality embryo. All right, thank you. And we have a question uh, in three parts, okay? So I had IVF yeah, with Donald Peck. I was advised three times for ultradestin and Lubin once a day. I had miscarriage at eight weeks. My, oh, sorry. And uh, I previously had three cycles with two times 400 cycle, cycle gen, gest and two biochemicals only. Well, it is important that you're getting pregnant, but unfortunately, the pregnancy does not continue. Now, progesterone is one reason, okay? I wouldn't say that your miscarriages were uh, because of uh, progesterone. Now, you have to measure the progesterone. You have to do blood tests of progesterone uh, when you get a positive pregnancy test. When you take the positive pregnancy test, there are three major hormones that you need to check. Estradiol, progesterone, and TSH. TSH is regarding your thyroid. Now, too much progesterone can be detrimental for the pregnancy. So there must be about two to one of estradiol to progesterone ratio. This is uh, very important to have this ratio. So by telling me all these different doses of progesterone means nothing. Most important thing means that at the time when your pregnancy test was positive, what was the value of your progesterone? If it was low and then you increase the doses, what was the value? And again I'm saying the progesterone that we use vaginally, we cannot measure it in the bloodstream. Only the progesterone that we take by mouth or intramuscular. So it's very important to measure the progesterone levels when you get pregnant and then every four or five days in order to make sure that the progesterone no are normal, the progesterone levels are normal. So the dosage by its own means nothing. The amount of progesterone in your bloodstream means a lot. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Tara. My embryologist said the other embryo was lower, two cell on day two, only three cell on day three. Small compacted morula on day four and fair quality early blastocysts won't be on day five. To my opinion, this embryo has low chance to start pregnancy. I have to travel far to get this IVF and after hearing this, I feel I need a new doctor. Do you agree? Well, as I said, the most important thing is to trust your doctor. You have to challenge him. You have to ask him what is his expertise opinion. And if you're not happy with his answers, then yes, you can change the doctor. I wouldn't say agree or disagree. I have to leave it on you. You have to make the decision if this doctor is good for you. You have to see if you trust him. You have to see if he's honest to you. You have to see if he talks to you and explains to you. In infertility, there is nothing right or wrong. It's not black and white. It's a rainbow, many colors. Even, as I said to you, you might have a bad embryo and you can be pregnant with a normal pregnancy. And you can have a perfect embryo and miscarry or not get pregnant. It's only chances. A good embryo has high chances of getting pregnant, a bad embryo has lower chances of getting pregnant. So every embryo, how it progresses from 2 to 4 to morula to blastocyst, is different. Also you have to know something important. What time was fertilization? At what time was the embryo checked? Because you can do an ICSI at one embryo at 1 o'clock and the at 1 egg, sorry, at one o'clock and then do ICSI to another egg 
after half an hour or after one hour. So you have to make sure the timing when you check the embryos and when you do the fertilization. I would say you are the one to make the decision about your doctor. You have to feel comfortable with your doctor and you have to trust. If you lose the trust, then you change. Otherwise, stay there. All right, thank you. From Sarah, we have a question. What did you mean by does donor blood fit your blood? Okay. Always try the donor to have a similar blood group either with your husband or with you. Uh, because that uh, will make it easier for you regarding the possibility of uh, a child in the future to ask you, uh, mother, what is your blood group? Dad, what is your blood group? Oh, mine is this. It doesn't coincide with yours. Have I been, how, how did I come to life? So that gives questions regarding pregnancy possibility. No, no, it, it doesn't play a role. It doesn't play a role. Like uh, if you use a donor from a different group, uh, it will not uh, change the possibility of you getting pregnant. It's only in the future, if you don't want your child ever to know that it's been from a donor egg, then you should have a donor that matches your blood group. Because otherwise, if the child is a uh, blood group that it doesn't coincide with you, it's a possibility to question you about that. That's the only reason I mentioned about blood group. Okay, perfect, thank you. From Sarah, in what cases should aphrin be given? Well, in the case uh, of uh, lupus, a uh, disease called uh, lupus, systemic lupus erythrosomatosis, that's when you give aspirin. Or some women, they don't want to take anticoagulant uh, by injection, so they will not like to do injections on themselves, so then, yes, um, we will give aspirin. All these anticoagulants, either aspirin or heparin, what it does, it does, does not allow the blood to clot easily, so all the hormones that feed the pregnancy will go to the uterus much easier, especially when women have bad endometrium or they have fibroids where vascularity is affected, you want to make the blood thinner so the blood can travel much easier through the vessels. Or you have older women trying to get pregnant with donor eggs. That means the vascular system is not functioning well because the vessel is not as good as, as when you were young, 20 years old. So aspirin or heparin will thin the blood so the transport of all these hormones that will feed the pregnancy will travel much easier to the pregnancy. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Is it recommended to have a histoscopy if the test was normal before the first pregnancy? Well, <laughs> after your pregnancy, you don't know if something change after the pregnancy in your uterus. No, it's not recommended. Uh, only if there is doubt about the quality of your endometrium. If there is doubt, even though you were pregnant, even though you delivered, if there is doubt about the quality of your endometrium, then it's recommended. Otherwise, no, it's not recommended. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. We have another question from Elena. Uh, what do you think about the Ukrainian donation program? Do you have any information about the results of the Ukrainian clinics? Well, I don't believe in numbers. Like, I, if I see an IVF unit that says, oh, I have 60% pregnancy rate and another 30% pregnancy rate, I will go to both of them. But the, the number would not make me make the decision. Why? Because what happens if I belong in the 40%, the 60% pregnancy rate unit has 40% failure rate. What happens if I go there and belong in the 40%? The other one has 30% pregnancy rate and 70% failure rate. What happens if I go there and I become the 30% and I got pregnant? What I have to check, not the numbers, I have to check the person that will look after me, how he will treat me how time he will spend with me, how he will investigate me, how do I feel, do I trust this person, should I trust 
my infertility problem? Is he looking after me? Is he spending two minutes and then said, okay, go to do this test and uh, come back after a month? How, how much time he will spend with me? That's the important thing. So any unit, any unit in this world that deals with infertility is a good unit. But the most important thing is, is it a good unit for me? I have to decide on that. Not the numbers, not the fancy um, lab or the fancy waiting room. I just have to see the people that work there, how good are with me, how they will help me. And then I have to see their experience, then I have to see the lab, how good their lab is. But numbers mean nothing. So answering to your question, what do I think about the Ukrainian? Perfect. If you want to go there, you just have to visit them and then just say, yes, they are good for me and try them. And then if you are not happy, you just have to try something else. You make the decision. Okay, perfect. Thank you for explaining that. Can MRI show the shape of uterus? Yes, MRI is very helpful. It can show the shape of the uterus, especially when you have fibroids. Then it can tell you, give you a lot of information about the way that the fibroids affect the uterus. But again, uh, MRI is just one tool, but the golden tool for the uterus, and especially for the cavity, that's where the embryos are implanted, the endometrium, is the hysteroscopy. MRI will help you, but don't uh, rely only on the MRI. Definitely have a hysteroscopy when you have a question about your uterus, when you have a question about your endometrium. And again, think of what I said on my talk. The most important role in pregnancy is the embryo. If you have a good quality embryo, you have higher chances of getting pregnant. Okay, thank you. Our last cycle was in Greece by a donor. Uh, we were told once where the sperm was collected that the egg collection would be done the next day. Process used was IVF. Is that the right, right way to do IVF? Well, the question is that your husband gave the sperm a day before. Uh, well, the sperm should be given at the day of the egg collection of, uh, of the donor. That's the correct way. Uh, if you didn't get pregnant, could that be a possibility why you didn't get? Yes, it is a possibility. That, that's the reason you didn't get pregnant. But again, it all depends how good the sperm was. Now, is this something wrong? Yes and no. Why I say yes, because uh, having a fresh sperm is much better than having uh, 24 hours waiting prepared sperm, because definitely this sperm was prepared. And uh, a good sperm, from my experience, uh, when you prepare a sperm for either intrauterine insemination or for ICSI or for IVS, can be alive and good in the incubator for two or three or four days. So it depends the quality of, of the sperm. But again, it's better to give the sperm on the day of the egg collection. And again, it's not something wrong. Uh, I wouldn't advise you to do it, but it's not something wrong. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. And we have another question from Charmini. Uh, what do you do to prepare your endometrium? Well, I prefer artificial cycles. I prefer cycles uh, that I can control them. I don't like natural cycles because natural cycles can um, give you problems. That means you can have an early rise of progesterone and um, you can lose the implantation windows. So by artificial cycles, you can control the endometrium. You're sure that uh, you have the right size and you know exactly when you, you will give your progesterone and then you know exactly the time that you will do uh, your embryo transfer. So having artificial cycles, it's much better and gives you better chances of having a successful pregnancy. Natural cycles, okay, it's good, but uh, it can be sometimes detrimental with the premature rise of progesterone. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. And we will have now the last question for today from Georgi. Um, is the number of embryos available for transfer the only reason to decide on which day to transfer? Uh, can there be a reason not to wait for blastocyst transfer even if we have a lot of embryos available? Well, it depends quite a lot on the history. If this was your first IVF attempt or if you had other previous IVF failures. Uh, the number of the embryos is uh, the major reason to decide on which day to transfer because if you have enough embryos, you're not afraid not to end up without embryo transfer because a lot of embryos will be lost in your system when you culture them whereas if they go back to the normal environment they will probably survive so because you don't want to lose too many you must have many in order to do blastocysts um, now can there be a reason not to wait for blastocyst transfer if we have a lot of embryos available well, uh, the other reason is that you want to have more embryos to freeze. So the best thing if you have a good number of embryos to do a day three transfer, you choose the best of them. And then if you want to see or the rest of the embryos will be going to blastocysts, would you wait? Or if you don't want to wait to lose again embryos, day three transfer, day three freezing. So if you don't get pregnant, you have more embryos to manipulate with uh, with the next uh, transfer. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry we have two more questions, okay? But that will be all, okay? Um, so I have had three chemical pregnancies. The question is, what do you suggest I do to prevent? Well, uh, <laughs> the most important thing is uh, what is your age? And again, the other thing is you're getting pregnant, but this pregnancy does not continue. Well, if, uh, if you are young, that means you have to do a lot of investigation regarding your chromosomes. If there is some kind of disease that you have, it doesn't allow the embryos to continue to grow. If you are older, you're very lucky that you're getting pregnant, but unlikely that the pregnancy does not continue. Um, so the reason is mainly you have uh, chromosomal abnormality embryos uh, uh, implanted. So that's why you don't continue to grow. And the other thing is you have to make sure that uh, you have a good endometrium. Are you sure you have a good endometrium? So if you're placing good embryos, uh, is your endometrium good in order to keep them there? The other thing is if uh, you have a good endometrium, you just have to try donor eggs. And trying donor eggs, you will see if you do get pregnant and you don't have uh, a miscarriage and you don't have a biochemical pregnancy. Biochemical pregnancy means that you have a positive HCG, but this did not continue to see a sac or an embryo with a fetal heart. So what I suggest is uh, use donor eggs. Okay, thank you. And we will have the last and final question, okay? From Karen, does frozen sperm decrease quality of embryo? We gave sperm sample three years ago and are doing a cycle in January with donor egg. I wish you the best. You will get pregnant. It's fine. We gave a child after 12 years of um, cryopreservation of sperm. So don't worry about that. The most important thing is that the sperm quality was good at the time of freezing it. So if you had a good sperm quality at the time of freezing, even if you do it after four years or five years or six years, don't worry about that. Your good quality eggs of the donor, being a young donor, even if you have a minor sperm problem, it will cover it and you will be pregnant and you will have a successful pregnancy. So go ahead, use it, and uh, I hope I hear from you that uh, you're pregnant. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for all of your questions and of course Dr. Dino for answering all of them as well. I just wanted to remind you that if you have any requests or have any other questions you can email this to us so patient at eggdonationfriends.com we can definitely forward them to the doctor as well. Okay. And I believe we can finish our webinar today. I invite you to join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. 
um, UK time um, for the next webinar. And Dr. Dino, do you have anything to add? Well, I want to wish all the couples that are trying a successful pregnancy to trust the doctor, believe on them, but always challenge them, ask them questions, don't be afraid to ask questions, live a normal life, don't change your habits, but if you have bad habits, those change, keep smiling, think positive, and you will succeed. And thank you for spending all this time uh, with us tonight. Thank you for that. I believe this is the perfect um, sum up for today. So thank you again. Have a good night and hope to see you tomorrow and the next day uh, as we will have another webinar. Okay. Have a very good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.